Okay, good afternoon everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Earlier, we presented to you our marine management proposal for the Sargasso Sea. But how did we decide what would be managed? As biologists, we might be tempted to protect all important habitats and all important species in the Sargasso Sea. But as policymakers, we know that that's simply not realistic. So instead of looking just through the eyes of biologists, we also had to look through the eyes of fishermen, of shipping companies, and of deep sea miners. So in order to create our management proposal for the Sargasso Sea, we first had to prioritize the natural resources that we wanted to focus on for management. These natural resources are called conservation targets. With that, I'd like to walk you through how we decided on our conservation targets. First, Will and I are going to speak about some of the important habitats and important species in the Sargasso Sea. Second, Anthony will discuss the process of how we chose our conservation targets. Third, once we've discussed what we want to protect and how we plan on protecting it, Lena will speak to us about who we should involve in managing these conservation targets. Who are the stakeholders who care most about the overarching goal of, of achieving sustainable use of the Sargasso Sea? Finally, we will, outline, we will outline how our research was translated into specific policies that we created for our management proposal. But first, I'd like to talk about the two habitats we're going to highlight here. These two habitats are sargassum and seamounts. So let's start with seamounts. First of all, what are seamounts? I, I personally didn't know before coming to sea semester. So seamounts are underwater mountains. They are created by volcanoes that are no longer erupting. There are roughly 100,000 seamounts worldwide. Some lie a mile beneath the surface, and many lie hundreds of miles offshore. So why do we care about seamounts? Here are three reasons why. First, seamounts are biodiversity hotspots. They act as an oasis of life in what is otherwise a relatively nutrient-poor open ocean desert. And as Simon talked to us earlier today, you know, we're still learning about this open ocean desert, and perhaps it's more productive than we thought. But in any case, seamounts are an especially important part of that. We're still learning a lot about seamounts, but we think the reason that they are so productive is because of the currents that surround them. So you have these upwelling currents that bring nutrients from the seafloor up the sides of seamounts, and you also have circulating currents, which basically trap nutrients and small organisms in this ecosystem. So instead of having, like I said, this, this relatively nutrient-poor open ocean desert, you have a mountainside spotted with sponge beds, deep sea corals, and so many other organisms. In fact, 670 species have been found just in the seamounts that lie in the Sargasso Sea. All right, secondly, seamounts also act as a feeding ground for passing visitors that live not just on the seamount ecosystem, but that migrate by them. These include tunas, swordfish, eels, sharks, whales, sea turtles, and, and many other species. And we care about these animals for food and for ecotourism. Finally, seamounts are, imp are important to the medical field because they host organisms, like some of the ones that you see here, that are being researched for use in pharmaceuticals. All right, next I'd like us to take a closer look at sargassum, which we've heard a little bit about already from Billy Causey, so thank you for that. As you can see, sargassum is a type of seaweed. There are actually many species of sargassum that um, live throughout the world, but only a few of these species are found in the Sargasso Sea, where we're studying. So where do we all usually see seaweeds? Well, I live in Maine, so I see them attached to the rocky coastlines that, that characterize our beaches but these seaweeds are different. These seaweeds spend their entire life cycle in the open ocean, never attaching to land. Uh, so these sargassum species are so abundant that the Sargasso Sea was named after them. So anyway, who cares about these seaweeds that live out in the middle of the ocean, like I've just explained? First, like seamounts, sargassum act as an oasis of life in what is otherwise a relatively barren open ocean environment. This is because there's close nutrient cycling between the animals that live in sargassum and the sargassum seaweed itself. Secondly, 
it is not just the animals that live right in sargassum clumps that need this floating habitat. More than 100 species of invertebrate, 280 species of fish, four species of turtle, and 23 seabirds rely on the sargassum habitat. They, they might use the habitat for spawning, for feeding, or for nursery grounds like these turtles do. These turtles use the sargassum as a nursery ground when they are young because they can be more hidden from large predators when they're in this habitat. Also, important commercial species like tuna use the, uh, the animals that live in the sargassum clumps as, as food. And Will will be speaking more to us shortly about the specific species that we care about that live in this floating habitat and others in the Sargasso Sea. All right, so the sargassum, the sargassum weed, it's very important, but the most important reason is because of the sargassum community that lives on and around it. There are hundreds of species of plankton that use the entire area as a food source. And those plankton are important because they float around and act as food for other more important species. Well, not more important, but just as important species. <laughs> more important to us, maybe. So along with those hundreds of uh, planktonic species, there are also 10 endemic species, species that are found nowhere else in the world. They rely on the sargassum for more than one reason. Number one, they use it as a food source. Number two, they use it as a home. They can't live anywhere else because they have evolved alongside it and blend in. If they were to be found anywhere else, they'd be extremely conspicuous and would be eaten rapidly by other fish. They are, uh, sargassum is currently threatened by sargassum harvesting and pollution. Other important species that use the Sargasso Sea are top predators. Top predators are extremely important members of uh, the ecological community. Most of them are migratory in the Sargasso Sea, and they, and they, uh, they are an important role in the sea because they act as top predators, controlling the populations of every fish and every other organism below them. Without uh, top predators, such as in this, in this chart, Without the shark eating all the fish below it, uh, the large fish species there would increase. This increase in large fish would cause them to eat most of the uh, herring up there. And without the herring to control the crustacean numbers, the crustaceans would complete, well, they would eat an unsustainable level of phytoplankton. Since phytoplankton create energy through the sun, they provide all the energy that the sea can use. And without them, the entire ecosystem would collapse. Uh, causing there to be less food for everything, and then they'd all die out. They're important for the survival, so that's why top predators are important for the survival of everything, and they are currently threatened by many man-made uh, features. Other important species are, incur are commercially important species. Uh, they, uh, some, like the tuna species here, serve the important role of top predators, but they serve an equally important role as being delicious. They are extremely economically valuable. Um, we catch them, we eat them, they serve as important members of the food service industry. And if we keep harvesting them at unsustainable rates, we can currently find ourselves without delicious tuna to eat. So that's an important species to protect as well, other than the fact that they're top predators and controlling the populations of other fish in the sea. Then, Last on our list of uh, important species to look at are endangered species. We are specifically targeting North Atlantic right whales who are currently on the red list for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They, right whales are important because they are popular with stakeholders, so they are very easy to uh, enforce policies around because people want policies around them. But they also serve important roles as ecological engineers. They, um, Number one is when they uh, feed, they dive down to the deep, to deep waters to find their food, normally krill and other species of fish. And then when they surface to breathe, they excrete tons of nutrients out, which float to the surface and provide nutrients for all of the other fish species and plankton living there. But then when they die, they serve an equally important role during whale falls, where they fall to the seafloor and provide nutrient hotspots for hundreds of species down in the deep sea that survive on nothing else but these whale falls. And one whale can serve, uh, one whale can serve as food for those hundreds of species 
for decades and decades. So much food. Um, I will now invite Anthony up here to explain the methods of how we choose these specific species. So far, Helene and Will have mentioned conservation targets like sargassum seaweed, sea mounts, and commercially important species and endangered species like tuna, for example. For this proposal, however, I would like to make it clear that we are basing our management scheme off of four main conservation targets, the first of which is shown here on the board. Sargassum has been chosen as one of our targets because it is a criti critical habitat for a wide array of organisms. Seamounts has been chosen as the other conservation target for the very same reason. They support a unique diversity that otherwise would not be found on the deep ocean floor. The North Atlantic right whale and tuna and tuna-like species have been chosen as our target species for the management proposal. Tuna and tuna-like species have been chosen namely because of their great economic importance. As for the North Atlantic right whale, their habitat extends along the eastern coast of the United States, which is included in the western portion of the Sargasso Sea. Now you all might be wondering just exactly how we came to this final decision for our marine management proposal. And here is where I'll be getting into the minute details of the whole process. Conservation planning is an important process that needs to be well thought out and many questions need to be answered before the development of any plan begins. Questions like how to define and determine targets and ultimately what the potential targets may be for the area of concern. The most important step in creating a marine management area with conservation as a priority is to collect data from a number of scientific sources in order to get an understanding of the biological and physical processes. If there isn't a foundation of science behind any management regime, policymakers and research manager, resource managers will make misguided decisions and ultimately end up with all the blame. Once enough sound data has been gathered, conservation planners need to decide whether to focus on direct species or have a broader target like habitats. More recently, there's been a shift from species-specific management plans to plans that are more ecosystem-based. And that makes sense since we know that animals don't live in a box by themselves. They're very, direct, they're very connected to their environment. As for, as for highly migratory fish, however, a species-based approach is taken into consideration. The North Atlantic right whale's habitat takes up most of the North Atlantic. And the, tuna, and the Atlantic bluefin tuna's habitat encompasses the entire Atlantic Ocean with spawning grounds in the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean Sea, as shown here in the darker green. As much as we would like to make conservation plans for an entire ecosystem like the Sargasso Sea or the Atlantic Ocean, we know that simply is not feasible. So now, what do we do with all the data that we've gathered? We find critical areas where there's representation, connectivity and spread among our conservation targets and apply a, a management area based off of that. Size and shape of the management area also need to be taken into consideration. The, the management area needs to be large enough to protect the array of habitat and species, but small enough to realistically manage and enforce it. And, um, excuse me. By identifying conservation targets before creating a plan, it is easier to determine which stakeholders are needed to communicate with and to create a successful management plan. And here's where I'll turn it over to Lena to talk a little bit more about stakeholder involvement. So as Anthony mentioned, identifying conservation targets aids in this process of marine management planning, but also with engaging with stakeholders. If we know what stakeholders are invested in what conservation targets, this will help us enact ocean policy and also help with enforcing it. But first we need to answer one really key question. What conservation target will be most effective in engaging with what stakeholder? Now there's no simple answer to this question. However, the following stakeholders that I will talk about have been linked to targets that we think they are directly related to, invested in, engaged with, either economically or ecologically. So, our first conservation target we're going to look at is sargassum. Now, sargassum at first glance is just seaweed floating in the open ocean. However, it has the potential to engage stakeholders. In fact, much of the support for conservation of the Sargasso Sea stemmed from stakeholder investment in sargassum. 
And these stakeholders include scientists in the United States, stakeholders in the international fishing industry, and us SCA students. The, uh, the scientists, stakeholders of the U.S. have had influence over U.S. ocean policy. And in fact, in the U.S. EEZ off the coast of the Carolinas, sargassum harvesting has been prohibited or highly restricted. Additionally, uh, members of the international fishing community have shown and acknowledged this key importance of sargassum as a key fish uh, habitat or for juvenile fish. The International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna has recognized sargassum's role and will be a key stakeholder in supporting sargassum conservation. And finally, while at sea, during our five-week cruise, my classmates and I went from mildly interested observers of sargassum <laughs> to passionate advocates for its protection and conservation. So as you can see, sargassum already has these engaged stakeholders, which is very important for its conservation. Now, moving on to seamounts. Uh, which is our next conservation target. As Helena mentioned earlier, they are key hotspots of diversity and biological activity in life. So unsurprisingly, scientists, who are the, always the curious explorers, are really interested in understanding, protecting, and researching these really incredible ecosystems. However, seamounts hold another area of interest for stakeholders, and that is the potential for mineral resources. The International Seabed Authority has recognized the potential for mining in these areas. However, it's also recognized the need for conservation and protection of these seamounts. So if any further protection is to go forward towards seamount protection, it needs to involve both the scientists and the International Seabed Authority. Now, engaging with stakeholders using these habitat Ecosystem, uh, habitat targets can be a challenge. No one's really seen them, no one's interacted with them. However, if you use a key conservation species target, say a charismatic megafauna, often the policy goes through much easier. If you've ever been out whale watching and seen whales or dolphins, if you've ever been out sailing and seen dolphins and cried, or guilty parties among us, <laughs> uh, then you are a key invested stakeholder in these animals' futures. Bermuda relies economically on the tourism generated from whale and dolphin watching, and therefore they have incentive to engage and protect w these conservation targets, both the people and the government. Okay. Now, with re regards to my last conservation target, I bet that almost all of you are already engaged uh, uh, and in invested stakeholders. How many people have ever had a tuna fish sandwich? <laughs> or tuna on your sushi? <laughs> so you and I, the consumers, the fishermen and s restaurant chefs, and all other members of the international fishing industry are key stakeholders in the F Sargasso Sea and Atlantic's tuna. Uh, so the t tuna populations, as mentioned earlier, are, uh, some tuna populations are in decline and def desperately need our protection. For sustainable fishing to continue into the future, we as stakeholders need to invest in these conservation targets and acknowledge that they need our support. Additional stakeholders in, the tu in tuna include the big and powerful fishing nations, Japan, the United States, and Mexico. You'll hear more about fishing in the Sargasso Sea later. And the International Convention for the, sorry, International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna. These stakeholders are highly invested in tuna. They gain huge economic profits from the tuna industry. <coughs> However, in regards to conservation, they seem to be lagging. So we need to engage these to encourage for further conservation. We encourage education towards sustainable fishing practices in hopes that these stakeholders, these major fishing nations, will recognize the vital role of their support in ocean conservation. And lastly, I'd like to bring up Helena and Anthony also to talk about some other recommendations we have for our management plan in the Sargasso Sea. Okay, so now that we've covered some of the natural resources that we care about protecting in the Sargasso Sea, let's talk about how we plan on protecting them. After a substantial discussion and debate, our entire class came to a consensus on these policies that I'm about to outline that are now in our management proposal for the Sargasso Sea. First, we propose a moratorium on sargassum harvesting. Sargassum harvesting has already been discussed by Billy Causey, but I will, I will reiterate that it is an industry that has in the past been done in the U.S. and is still being done in other waters around the world. Um, so sargassum is used as a fertilizer for cattle feed. It's been proposed for use as biofuels and other uses. So our moratorium on sargassum harvesting would continue until a sustainable harvest quota could be determined through further research.
All right, next, let's talk about our policy recommendations for seamounts. Though no one is currently mining in the Sargasso Sea, there are minerals on seamounts that may be mined in the future. As you can imagine, digging up minerals that lie beneath the surface of seamounts can have fatal impacts for the organisms that live on top of those seamounts. So keep in mind that deep sea organisms tend to be long lived, slow to mature, and they produce few offspring. So these kinds of impacts on seamounts could have really long term effects. So these are our uh, seamount areas that we plan on protecting, shown in the, in the red arrows up here. And like sargassum harvesting, which has very severe impacts on an entire habitat, we recommend that seamount mining is prohibited over these designated seamount areas. This closure would continue until environmental impact assessments could prove that mining methods would not cause significant adverse impacts to those ecosystems. And as Lena already outlined, the International Seabed Authority would manage this policy. We also recommend that the seamount regions be classified as particularly sensitive sea areas. This is a classification made under the International Maritime Organization, and it allows this organization to put very strict regulations on what kinds of discharge ships are allowed to, to discharge when they're passing over the seamounts. I would like to add that we have created other restrictions and management around seamounts, tuna, and North Atlantic right whales. And some of these targets will be, um, some of these policies will be covered later in the day by other work groups. I'll now hand it over to Anthony, who will discuss our final policy recommendations. So our final management, or final recommendation for the management proposal is, to, is that the U.S. and other Hamilton Declaration signatories support research in the Sargasso Sea. In particular, we would like to identify four main areas as priority for scientific research. Here in the New England Seamounts, in the Corner Rise Seamounts, an Eastern Research Station, and a Western Research Station. The Eastern and Western Research Stations are important to see if there are any true environmental differences between the highly trafficked Western, Sar Western area and the not so traveled Eastern Sargasso Sea. I'd like to thank you all for your time, and with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you guys for that, but you're going to have to help me understand why you picked the Northern White Whale essay. Sure, I would love right. to answer that yes. for you, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a really good question, and you know, I think if I was coming in from the outside, I would ask the exact same thing. So, as we've heard from Dr. Gerold and many others today, there are so many species that are traveling through the Sargasso Sea, if we're just going to talk about species, you know, migratory species alone. However, I also, as has been covered today, there's a lot of research that is still coming out about these species and a lot that we still don't know. So, basically what we did is we chose an organism that is already endangered, that we know quite a lot about its, its habitat, its critical habitat, and that has you know, broader uh, ecosystem impacts as the ones that Will outlined. So it's, it's certainly true that you know, if we went back and did this with more research or with more, with more time, we would potentially be able to find more species targets to be able to create specific management around. But for example, we, we considered, I mean, you know, this process took, took days, right? So we did consider a lot of other species for example, poor beagle sharks, which are known to humpback whales, which are which are known to travel through the Sargasso Sea. But for example, the papers we were looking at on poor, be poor beagle sharks were sometimes looking at just a few individuals. So, you know, it was harder to back up our, our policies with a lot of science to. Well, that's the question because the distribution map tends to show it associated with the Gulf Stream and the coast kind of northern, circulating yeah. around that. So I, I just don't know the strength of evidence that they really utilize that, and that may be because mm -hmm. maybe they haven't updated to. Map out its pattern distribution. So I wonder if anything came to your attention that you have a stronger case for their actual presence in the circus as well as the peripheral. Um, Anna Molly has done some, uh, so that was kind of her area of focus, and she's looking into that more. So during one of the breaks, if you want to talk to her more about that, that's a really good point. Yes. So um, you talked about having more tourism on various commercial activities. I know that in the Phoenix Island protected area, mm -hmm. um, compensation for the nation of Kiribati, the income loss for fishing 
licensing and, and stuff like that is a critical part of establishing that uh, protected area. Have you even really thought about that strategy and whether there needs to be financial incentives to support this kind of thing? We, we have, and those will be discussed in a later presentation. But there, there are some ideas we've had for the government sponsoring uh, uh, incentives for fishermen to stop certain behaviors. And exactly, and, and just to mention a few, um, you know, buyback programs for different kinds of fishing gear will we'll be discussed later. Um, also, we, you know, we also discussed putting sort of the incentive of putting sustainable seafood markers on seafood, which we have a specialist in the room. She she is involved in, in basically labeling the seafood so that people know that it's caught sustainably, and those are all really good incentives, you know, that are part of the strategy. Um, having studied in the Sargasso Sea yourself, have you thought about what kind of research plan you would propose for your east and west stations to monitor things and how often, that sort of thing? Yes, I would say it'd be more like a time series, kind of something like the Bermuda Atlantic time series. We know it is pretty far out there and it does take a while to go, just even off the 80 miles off the coast of Bermuda. However, we would think that it would show a, a really good difference between the highly trafficked west and the less traveled eastern area. And then if we could get any major differences behind that, really um, start to have better recommendations for the west and get a better idea with that. You mentioned that these are things that are kind of important to us, and you spend a lot of time debating it amongst yourselves. Um, I was wondering if you were able to look at any, see if there were any studies that, have, and I'm a social scientist, so I was wondering if you had any chance to see if there were any studies on what people around the area perceived as important as well, and see kind of what the stakeholders were sort of thinking was important to describe what you were thinking. We, haven't, we didn't, weren't able to find any particular studies. Um, in general, my, uh, when, talk, when I was talking about the charismatic megafauna, it's interesting. It's often a way to get less knowledgeable stakeholders on board. It's, oh, we want to save the whales, save the dolphins, they're pretty, the turtles are adorable. Um, but in terms of a more uh, encompassing ecosystem plan, that's not always the most effective for me. So there's sort of a trade-off. Do we want the most effective policy plan, or do we want something that's going to be easier to maybe get stakeholders on board with? But that would be really cool to study to look into it. I think yeah. you just answered my question, but I guess the eels are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> So basically what we had with that is their breeding grounds falls within the subtropical convergence zone, which is a pretty dynamic zone and it almost encompasses the entire height of the Sargasso Sea. So we figured that was kind of hard to make a management plan around. We've had that same discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, good job guys. Thank you.